Hello and welcome to Tea Book Club. Tea Book Club, we read a book a month on the subject of tea and we meet at the end of each month online around the world to discuss the book and share our thoughts. I'm doing every week a five minute reading from our book of the month so that people can see what it's about, catch up on the book, see where they might like to jump ahead to. If you'd like to find out more about Tea Book Club, the details and link are below. Feel free to subscribe and it would be lovely to see you there at our next monthly meetup. Our next meetup for January is actually next Sunday. So this month we have been reading A Social History of Tea by Jane Pettigrew and Bruce Richardson, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, so I highly recommend it. So to the five minute reading, Tea Wares. I'm jumping in at page 160. While the 18th century provided a tea infused impetus for women's suffrage, it also sparked an era of innovation in tea wares. As tea prices came down through the 1800s, the size of teapots increased, and as a result, so did the size of kettles. These became so unwieldy and heavy that most ladies could no longer easily manage to elegantly pour the boiling water into their porcelain and silver teapots. The tea urn had thus become a fashionable and decorative alternative, gracing many Victorian tea tables. At Dyrum Park in Gloucestershire, an inventory from 1839 lists a bronze tea urn with tea trays and a copper tea kettle kept in the butler's pantry. By 1871, the urn was listed in the inner pantry with a bronze tea kettle and four tea trays. The 19th century was a time of great innovation and invention, and the creation and design of the perfect teapot was a challenge taken up by many artisans and designers. The basic shape remained un remained relatively constant, alter altering slightly with the changes in design fashion. Details varied according to the inventiveness of the manufacturer. The Cadogan pot was filled from below. The Castle Ford had a sliding brass lid. Pots with two chambers and a filter between were designed on Chinese lines. Self-pouring pots with a pump action allowed ladies to pour without lifting the pot from the table. Other new ideas also caught the attention of the press. In May 1896, the Cater and Hotel Keepers Gazette announced the invention of a tea infuser, very familiar to us today, called a tiette. It consists of a deep spoon bowl perforated with small holes and slits and having attached to it by hinges a duplicate spoon bowl. The idea is that the spoon should be filled with the requisite amount of tea, then plunged into a cup or pot full of boiling water and withdrawn after a few minutes infusion. The tiet should be most useful for travelling luncheon baskets and might be introduced by caterers in tea rooms. European potteries and porcelain manufacturers started making full tea and breakfast sets in the 1790s, but until the second half of the 19th century, these were generally found only in the homes of the wealthy. The earliest sets consisted of 12 tea bowls, 12 straight-sided coffee cups, 12 saucers, a slop bowl for tea drinks, a sugar bowl, sometimes with its own lid, a milk jug, plates for bread and butter, and two teapots. Smaller side plates were not introduced until the mid-19th century when they were needed for the service of sandwiches and pastries at tea. The better off owned at least one tea service and grand houses usually owned several. The inventory at Dyrum Park in Gloucestershire listed part of the pink and white tea service, best china tea service, blue and gold border, 23 teacups and saucers, two bread and butter plates, part of a tea service, drab and gold border, part of a tea service, sprig pattern, part of a white tea service, part of a breakfast and tea service with pink border. At Tappan Park in Cheshire, the plethora of tea services owned by the Edgerton family is displayed in the china closet, along with nine, a 900-piece glass service stored in wooden coffers. Poorer families often owned a hodgepodge, mix and match selection of whatever they could afford or had been given. In Wales, Marie Trevelyan explained, Scarcely a house or cottage in Wales is without a corner cupboard. In it are kept the household treasures in the shape of teacups and saucers. It is not at all unusual to see china cups and saucers of the period when handles were unknown and teapots that were manufactured when tea was first used. Nevertheless, the desire to own a complete set was universal. Flora Thompson describes the arrival of a travelling salesman in Candleford. There was great excitement, and what bargains to be had. The tea service decorated with fat, full-blown pink roses, 21 pieces and not a flaw in any of them. Then the glorious unexpected happen happened. The man had brought the pink rose tea service forward again and was handling one of the cups around. You just look at the light through it. Ain't it lovely china, thin as an eggshell, practically transparent, and every one of them 
roses painted with a brush. Sorry, I needed an accent to go with that, I think. The tea service was brought by one of the village men who, only the night before, had returned from his soldiering in India. Willing hands helped him carry the tea service to his home. His bride-to-be was still away in service and little knew how many were envying her that night. The British porcelain companies, Minton, Worcester, Derby, Wedgwood and Staffordshire, Chelsea and others, were by now manufacturing tea services in porcelain and bone china. In Northanger Abbey, published in 1818, Jane Austen refers to the process of the porcelain industry. The elegance of the breakfast set forced itself on Catherine's notice when they were seated at table, and luckily it had be been the general's choice. That's five minutes, but we'll continue. He was enchanted by her pro approbation of his taste, confessed to it to be neat and simple, thought it right to encourage the manufacturer of his country, and for his part, to his uncritical palate, the tea was well flavoured from the clay of Staffordshire as that of Dresden or so. But this was quite an old set purchased two years ago. The manufacturer was much improved since then and has seen some beautiful specimens when last in town. Cups were made with and without handles and sauces were deep. Some social commentators have suggested that at one time it was acceptable to pour the tea from the tea bowl into the saucer in order to cool it slightly and then to drink the tea from the saucer. This would appear to have been very much a working class habit that was not approved by more elegant members of society. The question of the use of the saucer is confusing. It was discussed during the 19th century and a comment from the time tells us that its first use was believed to be merely to cool the tea, and then it was fashionable to drink from the cup. At a later time, the use of the saucer was understood to be confined to saving slops, and then forward the cup alone was to have the honour of being raised to the lips. The practice of drinking from the saucer seems to have continued amongst the lower classes, and there are references to, in contemporary literature to indicate that it continued well into the 20th century in some homes. This practice of drinking from the saucer was the inspiration for the American cup plates sometimes found on tea tables in that era, of that era. These small saucers were placed under the teacup while the saucer was serving its secondary role. Cup plates protected wooden tabletops from damage in water rings. They were also used by early tea drinkers when drinking from handleless Chinese teacups. First made from porcelain, they eventually became a favourite product of the pressed glass age. America's Boston and Sandwich Glass Factory, started in 1825, was quick to utilise a pressing machine to turn out thousands of pressed glass items known today as sandwich glass. These small glass trivets were eventually pressed with custom images and were mass-produced as souvenirs for weddings, political campaigns and popular vacation, vacation destinations. At Killerton House in Devon, the Acklan family remembered life in the 1850s. In those days, tea was very expensive and was kept locked up in a table. The table contained two wooden caddies, one for green tea and one for ordinary tea, and one or two large glass bowls, and these all fitted with, into their places. Grandmama had forgotten her keys, and, the Bronte, and Bronte, the family poodle, was sent to fetch them. In those days, ladies wore pockets tied around their waists and under their dresses. To the horror of the rather prudish people in those days, Bronte... Bronte reappeared and walked up to the dining room, dragging Grandma's pocket in which were the keys, and Grandpapa used to imitate their horror when he told the story. Towards the end of the century, when tea was cheaper, lockable ornate caddies from the drawing room were no longer a household necessity, and tin caddies were produced instead for storing tea in the kitchen. And we'll stop there, because we could keep talking, reading about tea with. I hope you enjoyed that snippet and if you would like to read more then join the book club and come along to our meetup on next Sunday um, when we will be discussing our thoughts and sharing our thoughts from around the world um, on the book and sharing what we found interesting about it. Hope to see you there. Thank you.